can't thank you all enough for coming out today. This has now been our tradition at Thistle Farms to come and spend Lent with you. And we have made so many friends. It is the highlight of our season. I bring you tidings and gratitude from the whole community at Thistle Farms. I'm prepared this year. I have fasted for 24 hours, waiting for the fish pudding aspect with a dollop of mayonnaise with a side of Boston cream pie. I'm just waiting to get through this sermon so I can get to it. I am not kidding. Well, I used to think what y'all did here was evil during the season of Lent with all that food, and then I realized you just have to adapt. So I'm treating it like Ramadan, that kind of fasting. And that sundown happens at 1 o'clock. And we come with all new products this year. We have our new outfits um, that Meredith, who is... Um, part of the community at Vanderbilt University and Thistle Farms, who is moving to Memphis. She and I are donning the new outfits, as well as Doris and Tracy, who are making return trips, and Brooke. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you for the whole, whole community. And I want to talk today and tomorrow. I have two days with you, and I want to just talk a little bit about what it means to search in the wilderness. What does it mean to search in this wilderness? Because I have a feeling that the distance between the wilderness and Jerusalem is not that far. And so what happens is this year is my 25th year of priesthood. And as it is for a lot of us, when we get some years under our belts, we learn a few things about this journey of the wilderness. And what I've learned as a priest is one no matter how much money any of us are given, we'll spend it. No matter how much time we are given in our ministry and on this earth, we will fill it. No matter how much power we are given in our work or in our individual lives, it will eventually be seated. I learned that just recently again when I was in preaching, getting ready to preach at the Diocese of New Jersey, and there was a retired bishop, very formally powerful man in that diocese. And he put on his cope and his miter and all of his vestments and his huge pectoral cross, but instead of a crozier, the big... Um, shepherd hook that bishops carry he was holding a small cane and it was a beautiful sign to remember that all of us need some humility in this work and to spend time on things that cannot be filled up and spent away and seated which leaves us simply with love we can spend our time learning how to live into love, how to serve love, how it is that love heals. Paul knew this in this beautiful reading. It was the wilderness time of the church, the early part where they're trying to figure it out, where they've been arrested, where they're arguing among each other. When he gets up to speak, they still say he's babbling where there's still contention everywhere and they're trying to figure out what does it mean to be community, to serve this living God post-resurrection. He knew it in Athens while he was wandering around that city that we're still searching and groping. And you know it. You know that just like Paul, there's so much that we do in our lives that is spent, filled, and seated. And so we search again and again for love. What lasts? What holds us? What gives us the hope to get to Jerusalem? How do we get there? You know enough that all of us don't have to pretend that we know everything that we still search and grope, 
The beauty of 25 years of ordination for me is I don't have to pretend that I can cast off things that no longer I believe in and hold on to the things that I believe in with much depth and hope. We know that even in our searching and groping, as we have done this year after year in this season of Lent, that we have glimpses of Jerusalem, that love continues to direct us. We can admit, like Paul itself, Paul himself, that even as we grope and search, we have this beautiful feeling that God is not far from us even now. It has become one of my favorite lines this Lenten season. We grope and we search only to discover God is not far from us. That has been the practice at Thistle Farms. If there's ever been an organization groping and searching for decades, it is Thistle Farms. Every time we started a new venture, we had no idea what we were doing. And we would come together in the circle and light a candle and say, we're lighting this candle for the next woman coming in off the street, and we would begin. We would start a cafe. We would start a line of products. We would go out into the world and meet new communities over and over, only to discover God was never far from us. And so it is that next week I head to Athens to stand in that same place where Paul once searched and groped. We continue to work with groups around the world, all survivors, all women who have known the universal issues of violence and borne it on their individual backs. That's been the story, and that is where we go to search and to discover how love is close. And if you've been paying attention for the last year, you know that near Athens there are refugee camps where women who are survivors of the war in Syria have fled with nothing, nothing. And they head out onto the shores of Turkey and cross the sea, just like Paul and his disciples. Perilous seas and weather to get there, to be in refugee camps, to then raise their children, to succumb to the vulnerability and violence of poverty in tents and cities where more and more borders are closed, so they'll be there for a long time. And so without knowing a lot, we started in the last few months looking into it and saying we could weave those life vests the women cross the sea in into welcome mats to be a sign and a symbol of how we love and welcome refugees as fellow sisters on this journey. We contacted them. They loved the idea about, I don't know how many women wanted to be a part of it. And we said, we're starting with a small group, 10 women, to gather and to become friends and to do this searching and groping together. We got on a conference call. We started making plans. We got funders together. And when we talked to the women the first time in the refugee camp, they said, we're happy to weave. We are grateful for the idea of economic independence through social enterprise, which is a beautiful way that love heals. But what we really want is a spa day. Oh, for everyone that didn't hear me, spa day. <laughs> I saw everybody lean in and go, what'd she say, what'd she say? <laughs> of course they want a spa day. After traveling all those perilous miles and going through so much, I would like to have some decent oils and bath and body care products. And we're like, you have no idea. You have come to the right place. <laughs> We can do spa day every day, but it reminds us how close we are. Amen? 
any group of women in the world that had gone through that want a spa day. We are so close. And in each other, we see God. So we seek and we search simply to love as calling does always. To find out how close we are and how, like the poet says, we are all the children of God wanting to love each other and we make our way to Jerusalem together. So what I think is if you in this season continue to search and grope, it will help you with three things. And the first one is it's completely free. The not knowing is completely freeing, not only to cast off things, but to let the waters of love that are rooted in justice carry you instead of continually fighting upstream on policies, on politics that don't bring us any closer to Jerusalem. I think it changes us. This searching and groping reminds us that it's not enough for you or I to change the world. We have to love it. And so if we want to love it, we have to continue to be willing to change so it helps us be courageous and humble in our work. And it allows us to simply do the corporal acts of mercy to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, give drink to the thirsty, visit the prisoners, to comfort the sorrowful, tend the sick, and bury the dead. That is how we search and grope, and that's how we remember how close God is in our lives. So I've been thinking about several, seven new ways that we can live into these corporal acts of mercy in this season, in the communities where we are, and in this world that will help us search and grope more. The first thing is to practice as communities and individuals the one sacrament called healing that we have in this church. While there are seven ways to practice it, healing is what we're looking for. Healing of ourselves and the communities to cast off shame, to transform brokenness into compassion and all those things that happen when we simply are looking for healing. Teach us, Paul, again. We have so many idols that we worship. The second thing is to grieve, to grieve with abandonment, to not let any fear of the unknown and death and things we lose to stop us from continuing that search. So we have to grieve well. The third is for all of us to transform our longing into that beautiful holy space called solitude. Groping and searching is a lonely endeavor, right? But it's a beautiful way to walk towards Jerusalem even when we do it together. The fourth is always do the grunt work. Always do the grunt work when you can. If you think that you're too good or not good enough for any act, it will impede you. There's nothing like a humble servant that will take out the trash or do the dishes and discover how in that service and in that work we find love. The fifth is give heed to your dreams. There's nothing in searching like a dream that can give you glimpses into where that search is carrying you. The sixth, listen to a stranger's story this season. Someone has a word for us if we listen. And it's not always the people closest to us, but to take time and hear a story we have never heard, a perspective we can only glimpse at in that searching. And finally, I think, to hear again the stories in our local community that are holding women up, and being that healing vessel for so much of our world. It is true that when you rape the women, you kill the village, and when you heal women, you heal the whole village. And I'm thinking specifically about Thistle and Bee, that beautiful community 
that you guys are doing so well and that is growing. And what my belief is in that searching and groping, if we serve communities like Thistle Farms and Thistles and Bees, like we are going to worship, that that is our worship. That we build up these communities like cathedrals. We will remember how close God is to us. We have been going around the country opening new communities like Thistle and Bee and Thistle Farms to be in an affiliated network with one another. To search and grope, and I'm not going to say the word grope anymore, it's now making me crazy to say it. <laughs> Let's just say search as we are all searching for how to do this work of justice. We need each other and we need to be together. Recently, we were on a trip in Omaha, Nebraska, where they've opened up a new house with the Episcopal Cathedral there, a beautiful community. They've raised hundreds of thousands of dollars just in the few months since we've been there. It's been amazing to watch. And I went out there with one of the women from Thistle Farms who, like most of the women, first rate between the ages of 7 and 11 and first hit the streets in her story after 6th grade. She was in a foster home where there was abuse, and she left, and she never went back. She, like a lot of the women, don't call themselves runaways. They call themselves throwaways because no one came after them. And that was where her journey in and out of the prisons and on the streets began and lasted for years. So she had seen a lot, but there was so much she hadn't seen, and she went with me to Nebraska and flew. And if you've been on an airplane, do you know how tiny those seats are, right? And Sophia, on the way back, we had spent four days working really hard with the community there, doing community work and fundraising and talking and preaching. I was tired. I wanted to go home. It was Sunday night, 8 p.m., flying out of Nebraska in November. And if you've ever been to Nebraska in November, you know everything is gray. The trees, the sky, the grass, the pavement. I mean, it's all not 50 shades of gray, but maybe 40 shades. <laughs> 40, 49 shades of gray. It's a little different. So we get on the plane to come home, and Sophia is all up in my space. And I'm like trying to do that thing where you're just trying to help move somebody over. But she's so excited to be on this flight and to see this stuff. And what I didn't know was we were on the flight when the supermoon was um, full. Because I was so not searching or looking or groping. I was done. I was done. She's all leaning up, and I realize what she's doing is she's taking pictures out the window of this moon. And so when I look, I realize it is huge and haloed. And it is lighting up all the clouds, those formerly gray clouds we have been looking at, where there were bands of red and purples and hues. It was stunning. And she leans on me as she's taking the pictures and looks up and said, I know this is crazy, but I never thought about a sky above the clouds. She never dreamed of a sky above the clouds, that vast expanse of interstellar space that we pray about, that her world had been so small and so scary that she never looked up. And how her whole world has changed through this community that kept searching for her while she was still searching. Only we are closer to the heavens than we know. So keep searching. Keep looking to the skies. Keep serving each other. Keep opening your heart. Do not let cynicism, fear, numbness cloud that vision. There is a whole world, and we are closer than we know.
Thank you.